Hey. Hi, Chris. Hey, Thank you so much for having us out. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jason. Nice to meet How you. you? It's wonderful meeting you guys. Both. Yeah. We were playing around with the uh, onboard the solar charging in real time. I was thinking of how, you know, for a lot of bigger families, this is gonna be like the commuter, it's not necessarily pile the whole family on board, but is there any concern or worry about a uh, solar overproduction? Because I know some people might not necessarily drive it 40 miles a day. Where does all that extra energy go? Like charge limits, that kind of thing? Yeah, my concern is more, how do we get it back to a useful place? Oh yeah. And there's not a lot of V to G technology out there. I'm talking to a couple inverter guys that can help us with onboard charger. They can also get it you know, back to your house. Oh. So the easiest way is to just send it to your power wall. Oh, there you so go. Then you, then you just charge a 48 volt power wall. And yeah. You're, you're good to go. You send the power somewhere. But getting it directly grid tied is a little more difficult if you're trying to invert it and put it straight to your house power. And it gets more complicated. And sure. There's all sorts of code issues and stuff. And you have to, for right. it has a special box. You buy a $4,000 box and you put it on your house. And you can plug J772 into your lightning pickup trucks and you can send yeah. it the box. We're trying to <laughs> not have people install a $4,000 box. Right. You know, a couple hundred dollars. Maybe seem reasonable. But sure. Like Four thousand dollar box. Sure. I think there's yes. an opportunity too, though. Conceptually, you have since you I wouldn't mean, call it overproduction, but okay. let's call it just what it is. It's it's pure energy. Yeah. Right. So instead of using that energy for motion, we can use it for a couple of the other accessories. You know, there's been questions like, oh, that light up logo or that thing, you know, uses energy. It's like we can conceptually we can take all that energy and use it to either cool the cabin, true, power some of true. these things that might seem more superfluous, but are actually essentially easily captured and easily manifested. Yeah, kind of like a like a cabin overheat protection type thing, preserve the- There's plenty of things to do with that energy. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people with EVs are used to frunks mm -hmm. and there may not necessarily be, which is not a deal breaker, but I'm curious like what's behind here? What's the rationale behind no like frontal storage area. We thought about it in the beginning and we thought, you know, hey, we could package some stuff rearward, but keeping as much weight forward as possible is the best for uh, suspension yeah. dynamics. True. So kind of all the inverters, all the um, uh, air compressor for the HVAC system, basically anything that we could cram in the front, we crammed in the front. Gotcha. Uh, so we took up all the space. You could, you know, put like a 12 pack cooler in there if you wanted to, but then like the return is so minimal. Three pack. <laughs> Maybe a four pack. Now we're really talking. Impressed. Well, when you think about the efficiency of packaging and, mm -hmm. the, and the shape of the vehicle, mm -hmm. everything has its place and its purpose. And there really is not a strong enough case for a large utility zone mm -hmm. that you would say, yeah, let's let's build around that. Now, when you look at other products, you can make that case. But in our case, there's really no need. And then you realize, okay, the things you think you want to do there, they're actually placed in better place than other places. Sure, we got the bunk. We've got, we got the, the, bunk, we got <laughs> huge, the cargo. huge area now back there. Now you know there. how to fill the wiper fluid. Right, yeah, that's a, that's a really well hidden little entry point. I love that. Is the HVAC system kind of a lock-in production-wise or is it still up for debate who's the um, supplier? Only? We, uh, we've been talking about some pumps and some things still, yeah. but I think that was chosen a couple of weeks ago. So I don't know okay. if there's anything left on the HVAC. The main, the main blower system was chosen very early on. Okay. Along with a couple other components that you then you design and engineer everything around. Now, it doesn't mean that that can't be upgraded. Sure. Because you need a longer lead time to develop your own. Right. But the, the HVAC blower unit was one of those like, hey, that's available. It meets our requirements. Uh, it, there's plenty of volume that it can put out and we don't have to reinvent that. Good. So we just packaged around that. I, I ask about it because everybody into this is going to be an efficiency nut. So yep. they're going to ask about every little watt hour and heat pumps were up for consideration, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But obviously the weather is really nice here. It's kind of on like easy mode in terms of battery management yep. and all that. But if we're driving this thing 70 miles an hour and it's 115 out, do you know like under max load how much that HVAC uses? 1800 watts is the most it can pull. Wow. Um, okay. So it can, you know, eighteen hundred put a put a dent in your uh, range for sure. On average, even if you're like really pumping it on a hot day, it's not going to use more than two hundred fifty, three hundred watts. Wow. That's you know, impressive. Just, just because it's a pretty small cabin, and you know, the, the blower motor adds a little to that, but the steady state current needs aren't, aren't that drastic. With the heat pump, it gets even better. But heat pumps, you know, it just it's a it's a four or five million dollar project and it's like an 18 month lead time so wow you know it's something, gotcha. that, we, something that we looked at last year and we were like it takes how long it costs how much yeah. <laughs> so yeah 
That's fair. Okay. But again, what we've done is take it like that thing takes us longer to develop the more efficient version, mm. right? But there's something that works really well and work, will work even better because we're less weight, we're better all the way around. So it becomes, even though it's extant, it becomes even more efficient than its normal use cases. Good, that's good. A help, that helps us to get to production right away. Awesome. The, in, the interesting thing about uh, a composite vehicle versus an aluminum or steel vehicle too, is an aluminum or steel vehicle, everything's a heat sink from the outside. Mm. So you're dragging all that heat from outside and you're just conducting it through the metal into your vehicle. True. Uh, this is like a thermos. You know, it's, uh, it's as insulated as it gets. Yeah. Um, with uh, with a composite structure, so it makes it a lot easier to cool. And you know, hot days, cold days, it's just a much easier to control environment. Smart. Those probably wouldn't be running at full blast constantly, right? It's just yeah. hard enough to cool the cabin, and then it kind of idles out, r reduces its power consumption. Are the vents just coming from around the display, or the, are there additional vents? Just around the display, and then for the uh... gamma, yes, right. But we'll show you inside. Yeah. Um, there is a full HVAC system that begins with uh, cowl defrost, oh, yeah. side defrost, uh -huh. side vents, center vents, oh. and feet vents. Good, it's good. All controllable. So again, that that HVAC unit has has all of that built in, basically. So wow. we just we just ducked it and then give you the controls. I think I asked Jason about this before, but like using the app to kind of move it based on where, what's sunnier throughout the day, like kind of a summon feature from the phone. All that software is stuff that we can make better and better over time. So yeah. there's tons of features that we have in the back of our mind that, that <laughs> yeah. aren't top of the list to get this vehicle into production and delivered. Uh -huh. That will be fun to do in the future. But you know, with the Calm AI system and being able to autonomously drive wherever you want to go, yeah, you, can, you wow. can move around throughout the day and change directions. And that's exciting. Do all sorts of fun stuff. With that, with that system, it also turns on the uh, turn signal for you when you're using the navigation. Oh, really? Okay, that'll be helpful. Cool. Speaking of production, I noticed after driving it with the display behind the yoke, those mirrors on the side aren't entirely necessary. I'm sure legally you're required to deliver it that way, but is Legally, it's... those those mirrors are great. Yeah? <laughs> they are awesome. Yeah. The best mirrors ever. Uh, right. Functionally, uh, we think that our heads-up system is a much better safety feature sure. for day and night driving. Yeah. And to have a full sight picture in front of you, uh -huh. we think that's the future and that's what uh, you know the government should approve yeah. in due time. Do you think it'll require special tools or something to if an individual was so uh, bold as to remove it? A three-inch grinding wheel and some uh, I think it's even less glasses. Really? I think you're more on track. Phillips screwdriver, call it a day. It won't be Velcro, but yeah, it's not, it's not Velcro, and also there's there's no Phillips. It's either going to be a, a, like a Torx or an Allen head. Gotcha. One of the kind of the design. There's no flathead. There's no there's no Phillips. Well, I loved Aaron too, by the way. Oh, good. I don't know what you called it, but I called it a porthole. Felt like just a little circle on the back to access the porthole. Now we have a name. There you go. <laughs> right. No, that's good. Um, keep in mind that we've relocated the valve, which is a very normal thing. In okay. A lot of uh, applications in like off-road and heavy trucks and so you relocate the valve stem so now that valve stem is centered oh. and so it's you don't have to clock it gotcha right? and then the the second thing is the the size of the opening is based on a kind of standard how big a 95th percentile hand is with the glove right. that's why it's such a size so gotcha you, you'd be able to you know remove that it also has a retainer strap on a hinge so you'd be able to locate and put on the air hose onto the Schrader valve Smart. So okay. It's built around kind of that ergonomic. Do all the tires have that same valve stem location? No. Okay, that's the root. Yeah, because of the pivot on the on the front wheel pants, we don't need to re relocate them. But in the design and engineering process, we did look at that. Like, what would it take to put, uh, you know, the, the valve in the center and then yeah. for just a small thing, uh -huh. uh, or a small porthole. Right. But it's really more elegant for the whole pant to rotate out of the way. It doesn't fall right. on the ground. You're not removing it. Smart. And you can get the air. You can get a service on brakes. You can get a service on wheel and tire with yeah. the front wheel pants. So is that going to be a little more complex on the back tire if you were doing a full wheel replacement? Or yes. For that case, you do have to remove that side pant. Gotcha. But it's designed, the assembly sequence is designed so you can remove two parts and then get at the big panel. Then you have all the service you need. And the vehicle has all the jacking points, not on Gamma, but in the production vehicle. Gotcha. There's jacking points for, for all of that service. Are you going to reveal those later? Can you kind of pinpoint? The jacking points? Yeah. It's under like, the lower A-arm in the front and right in front of the tire in the rear. So gotcha. There's, there's, I think there's six different points that work in conjunction if you want to jack okay. one side, the whole front, or the rear. Interesting. You can also basically jack it up at a corner of the battery pack. Oh, that's so smart. The corners of the battery pack, there's the aluminum extrusion that you saw on the mm -hmm. side. That's the basically the frame rail. That makes sense. Up by the frame rail on those four corners or the rear. 
in front of the tire right, uh -huh. where the swing arm is. Yeah, the, yeah. The front portion of the swing arm and then uh, underneath it, the arms in the front. Right. And I know uh, Jason's working on a video and some illustrations on how the rear wheel paint comes off. Oh, good, so good. It is more complex, but the edict that we set long ago was you got to be able to get into the front under 30 seconds and you got to be able to get in the rear in under two minutes. So, nice. uh, so you do have to remove more okay. passengers in the rear, but yeah, the, the rear is a little bit more complicated, but you know, we don't anticipate you'll need as much service there. Gotcha. But when you need it, it, it you will be able to get access to it. Well, I'm glad you put a time on it. You're like, it's got to be accessible. Yeah. And yeah, that quick. I think we beat both. The front are easy now. You just take the clip. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's uh, just a release pin, and then you just rotate. I love the that. With a detent. I mean, they're not powered. We show in the video. Yeah, yeah. Videos. They're called air ends. They're not called. How do you change the roof? Right. But no, the powered. I think would just be too complicated. Anyway. No need for it at this yeah. point because they're light enough weight. You're not accessing. You'll be able it. to detent it in place. It's not going to fall down. Yeah. And then there's a kind of safety pin on it. Mm -hmm. So. It's a really elegant solution. The doors, I love the way they just pop upwards. I can already picture like the car recognizing you're nearby and just popping it or whatever. Was there any rationale behind them going straight up? Does that help with efficiency or was it just like, that's cool? Excellent question. You don't have a lot of areas to hinge the door. Either you put a massive hinge here and you have it open like a traditional door, and yeah. under the wheel pan, oh, or you gotta I see. hinge it basically along this line. Yeah. So when you look at kind of this shape, and you're like, it's got to be this aerodynamic shape. Where the hell do you put the door? I mean, the right. natural hinge points are top and bottom of the A-pillar. Yeah. And that we went to Roush Engineering, and they, they've engineered some of the highest volume production <laughs> doors in the world. They helped us design the door, the hinge, and the seal strategy. Nice. Um, this is what they came up with. So there's a line between these two hinge points like that. Yeah. And that's just about which the door naturally hinges. So do it like a DeLorean here. Yeah, that yeah. That eats into your solar and does a whole bunch of other different things. It uh -huh. actually makes the door open wider than it does now. So I was uh, impressed how little natural. it goes outward Correct. when you open. That, it's was, like that a... was the main driver too. Along uh -huh. with that, you know, there's a natural access and the, you know, we've referred to them as like scarab style. Oh, yeah. And that's really the best way to, to get there. And then our, our our engineering partners in Italy, they kind of refined the process there. Yeah. And they've done several similar door systems. So we really oh, got the best gotcha. of, of the engineering solution. For production, the door will not fly all the way open. Okay. But it'll present itself, so then you'll be able to easily assist it with the gas drive. I see. Which is probably smart, because I've heard some people complain about Model X's opening too far or too quick, or you want to healthy middle we ground. need to find that balance yeah, yeah well, absolutely we're in that model x door too like, yeah you know, looks at the cameras and sees what's inside it's a whole right we, we don't want to spend three million dollars developing the software to open our door <laughs> yeah. uh, from the wheel pan i mean you you can park within basically a foot of a wall it's like 11 inches and you can still open the door there's a ultrasonic there too. yes in the gamma we have the ultrasonics here but we found it's much better uh to move them for production to the nose cone so oh, in really? production, there'll be, there'll be one here and one okay. there. And it, it has to do with the, the kind of the cone of what, what's read in, in order to not get any false signals. We also went to the software guys and they're like, great, you put them on the wheel pants. Now, every time you turn the wheel, Bingo. we have to correct it in software. Oh, oh I didn't so even think of that. You're ready to write a big software check to... Uh, wow. Because it would detect the nose or would detect... Yeah. It'd yeah. throw it off. Yep. Interesting. The production model, there's no ultrasonics on the wheel pant. No, no need. Just on the nose. Right. No nose. But it can detect even if you're in a tight spot yes. it's close enough wow yes it's technically not let's say aimed or oriented forward mm -hmm. it's aimed outward but it has a it has a cone of a cone of vision essentially gotcha of detection okay so it, it's kind of optimized for like where's that that best spread in order to perform its function and give you that warning like hey you're too close to this okay is the gamma display gamma display sorry, is that a little bigger than the production model it is this okay. was the 15 because that's what we could we could source at the time yeah um, but through our development and, and you know design and engineering process, we realized that uh, it's 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 oversized for the cabin. I agree. So That's the first right thing. Sized it <laughs> yeah. to, to and you'll see that in the in the interior uh, module. Okay. You'll see that twelve point eight is really much more. Uh, this is friendly. also a fifteen point six with a larger bezel on the bottom and side. Yeah. So oh, it's a gotcha. bit deceptive. Like yeah, it's a fifteen point six, but it's a fifteen point six with a big bezel around it too. Right. right. Because that was the first thing when I put my hands on the yoke. I was like, I'm already kind of eating into that screen. Yeah. Plus, I'm, I'm guessing the smaller screen uses less power. No. It's really how the screen's made that it uses less power. So there's, oh, interesting. there's new LED technology, uh -huh. but it uh -huh. uses like, you know, 20% of the power of like the screens 10 years ago. I had a Model S from 2015, uh -huh. but you know, on any given day, put your hand on the screen. Like, Holy yeah. <laughs> if it's sure. hot, it means it's using power. So, right. It's you know, the newer losses. screens use a lot less power and it's really just adapting to the new 
Yeah. Stuff. And you've got several displays in there. Are they kind of the same supplier doing the uh, we repeater? Wish. They're not. Oh, <laughs> they're, they're not. different. Okay. Yeah. What I noticed that I hope comes to production is the rear view screen. Is that the term for yes. the top one? Very high frame rate. Yes. At least compared to what I'm used to in the Model 3. Is that an intentional choice for like low latency response yes. times? So that should make it to production? What, do you know if it's like 60 frames a second? I don't, but we can ask. Okay, it's buttery. I was like it's used the, to it. It's the same camera for that as the side view, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, all the cameras, the cameras are smooth. processing. Wow. Yeah, and it, it's been calibrated as, as a system. Like, I know I know that. I, I want you to think of it in what you've experienced until now. Yeah. And then how much things are improving. The gotcha. cost of LEDs, efficiency of LEDs, uh -huh. the cost of screens, the efficiency of the screen, the efficiency of the cameras, the frame rate, all of that is improving. It's not Good. getting worse. Yeah, yeah. So we're able to like capture something and then look forward to the next generation. So this one's glass instead of plastic, right? This is kind yeah, of- Yeah, we'll show you some of the panels inside. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's really cool to have such a lightweight panel that you know even just even just tapping on it yeah. like, oh it's got to be plastic it's not it's glass wow and it's uh, very similar to the glass on your phone it's super tough it's super scratch resistant I and mean, obviously we want these things to last 10 plus years so the great thing about glass is the um, ability to transmit light uh, it doesn't block much light so the Good. problem with all the polymers was it blocked more light so we're taking like an extra five percent efficiency hit just by putting a polymer on top wow so this is an efficiency yeah. gain yeah. and a durability gain yep the main restrictor in the beginning when we first started looking at it was people didn't make glass big enough lightweight I glass see. that's big enough just didn't really exist people made like windshield glass and large panes of glass but this kind of lightweight super strong super tough glass it just didn't exist this wasn't so hard this guy in the rear hatch was really hard the really rear hatch yeah. is huge to get a forming machine that's this big and to roll that much glass was quite a challenge and, and jason and the engineering team and, and reed on the solar team kind of all done an awesome job and just making it all work what difference does it make having the split of like this part can roll down is it just this door can't fit the whole window or yeah so that's the, part of it it's so the, the glass mixture. comes in here okay. right mm -hmm. so you can have this lip catch air here or you can have it catch air up oh here. it's got to catch so it's got to catch some somewhere uh -huh. so if we had the window roll all the way up to here we'd be catching air here and it kills your laminar flow as it comes all the way over the back of the vehicle oh. Gotcha. And we found that if we can keep it down low, that it's just so much more efficient and solves other problems. If you go all the way to the top, then you have to roll down the window all the way into this belt line. Uh -huh. And because the body's so curvy, we didn't have a lot of space. It changes everything. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. No, this that is makes really sense. the most efficient. And it, it seems like, well, why did you do that? But it really is shape, weight, complexity, efficiency, and then aerodynamic hit. Yeah. And we yeah. can't, we can do a full drop. It compromises so large. Sure. And after, as you know, on your short drive, but after a while, it just becomes natural. Yeah, it you, blurs. You adapt to it right away. Your mind kind of fills in the gaps. I like asking questions like that because once people understand the why, it's not complaint as much anymore. Once people understand, oh, well, I would have gotten worse range if I had a full window, then they'd probably make the same choice. I never complained about the little bar in my DeLorean, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you own one? Yeah, I built the first electric DeLorean. Oh, that's cool, too. <laughs> uh, sold it to Google, and now they do they sell like HTC phones and stuff with it. They made a DeLorean oh, trailer. Fun. PI builds are intended to do kind of the longer range testing, because I know a lot of people want to know about like real world watt hours per mile versus simulations. Is there a intention on zero to 100 percent charge sessions depletion. yeah some of this stuff has to happen in sequence you know we have to test the spring rates before we actually work on the abs system the kind of sequence of it all is, is mildly nauseating sure. but we would love to get out and you know do range testing first and then have to have everything backtrack but really you know the simulations are so good now and they've matched everything else we've done so well good you know good. we have super high confidence that hey this, this vehicle is going to do x yeah know, over x miles kind of you know lower on our concern list gotcha than all of the supply chain that has to come together to actually make this vehicle happen we got to do that in a certain order so i would i would think by next you know march or april that we're probably doing range testing by then so if you need someone to do the range testing i volunteer you volunteer <laughs> with the astronaut diaper and just <laughs> yeah. i could do it we're going to do that later today anyway i was just <laughs> telling chris i'm like i wish we could just take this home yeah and then i'm guessing crash testing that's another big question Is that kind of last because you can't really do much with the pi after the crash testing or the crash testing kind of melds in with everything else okay we don't think uh we'll have to do a lot of changes to the structure because of crash testing because yeah. again the simulation tools are so good there are some crash tests where you expect to be able to use the rest of the vehicle so like full frontal offset frontal we'll probably be able to use the vehicle again 
Mm -hmm. The roof crush strength uh, test, though, it basically crushes your roof. You don't have a lot of body structure left after that. So you're probably throwing that one away. I see. Uh, but side impact and, and full frontal and offset frontal will probably be able to recycle those vehicles into other tests. Gotcha. Uh, it could be that the full frontal crash test one ends up being the interior buck to test the HVAC system. Mm. It's just like a static uh, vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, the offset frontal, you probably just replace this front clip and then you can you know, do a lot of different things with it. So, so we, we think that kind of ABS, um, suspension, calibration, and crash testing all kind of happen at the same time. I guess kind of a personal question, but I tell everybody I know about this. Good. <laughs> Sick of me because I'm like, hey, have you heard of this yet? And a lot of the first reaction usually comes up with safety. And I think it's purely just from people who haven't seen anything like it. So that's their first. Oh, it must be dangerous if it looks weird. I'm still working on kind of the best way to articulate the safety argument because I think it's safer than most would think with the crumple zone. And I don't know if there's much advantage to it. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but like having the wheels and not having an axle yeah. attached between them, that leaves less to be pushed into the cab, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, that accurate or? I mean, you probably <laughs> address is. safety in a different way than I do. But. <laughs> No, but Andrew, your, your point of view is, is correct. And then remember, we're building on, with our partnership, we're building on a lot of great experience important structures, dynamic impacts. So mm. the whole testing regimen, the whole, the whole uh, simulation, it's all been calibrated to a certain level, and then we'll do the, the actual physical yeah. uh, tests of that. Mm -hmm. then, you then you get the whole story. Right. Here's all of your strengths. Here's here's all how it performs. But you are right in just its general, you know, physique outside of the body. We also have, uh, you know, to your question on the window. Yeah. It's much stronger, this shape oh, versus a flat shape. Because it's kind of resisting any it's outward. Curved. There's no flat eggs. Uh -huh. They're they're protected and really strong and ultra lightweight for that reason. They they have that shape. I so see. it distributes forces in a different way simulation department has run through all of that and then they simulate what the composites do what the metallic structures do and then they simulate what it does together in all the dynamics because that's what they do that's what we're doing maybe the analogy i use a lot is bad but because you can tell even when you're sitting in it's much more rounded i yeah. think both on the bottom and the top in a side impact does that make it behave more like a beach ball than a cardboard box in terms of like if it gets a hard hit from the side it, as in it kind of get uh damaged inward towards the Ball versus cardboard box. That's your description. I think it's pretty good. <laughs> I just want to stop saying something if I'm like way off on anything. So that's Usually why. Usually when people I'm ask pitching. me about safety, I say it's built more like a Formula One car yeah. than anything else. I mean, uh -huh. Carbon fiber composite structures. Yeah. We have a crumple zone that exceeds five star crash rating in the U.S. Yeah, that's pretty far. We've got great uh, offset frontal protection because basically you can take the whole side wheel off and not touch the passengers at all. Right. And a side right. impact. We have this big boxed out section by your hip point and most injuries and side impact coming your hip points mm. the more you can protect your hip okay the better you are yeah and then you got this big carbon fiber roll cage that you know straps over the roof that protects the the occupants and, and roof crush and other things the cool thing about carbon fiber is you can spread load so so easily and quickly. right you can you can tune the fiber to spread the load while steel and aluminum don't really do that they they deform mm. in an accident versus versus spreading the load to other parts of the vehicle so you know, we're, we're able to design this, you know, Formula One cars take accidents at 220 miles an hour and Ooh. the driver walks away. <laughs> you know, we're able to put that right. kind of technology, you know, not only from Jason's experience and the experience design team here, but also the Italians that design some of the world's greatest supercars. That's this, you find the world's most wow. aerodynamic, efficient supercar built with those kind of safety standards that are built into those other supercars, you know, in mind. That's just thinking how much room there is just from the front to where the driver said it's really to the bulkhead so oh okay you know the, the crumple zone Crumples is basically a can that exists between the bulkhead and the front of the vehicle okay but it's deceptive because you know we have a really long nose you guys got like 32 plus uh -huh. inches uh -huh. you know, all that's crushable space you know that's that seems like it'd be pretty good the leg room on this is absurd is that production or is this a little bit roomier than the pi builds are going to be production is a little bit better what yes so this is like meant for six foot ten Seven foot. Six foot <laughs> my uncle was sitting in it just fine yeah. and i feel like there's better leg room in this than in my model three there is from from one point of view your seating position is optimized for this shape uh -huh. it, it's not necessarily optimized as the most comfortable thing ever mm. but it's comfortable enough relative to what you're getting well i mean comfort's huge especially if you're going to be making thousand mile range like you said the astronaut diaper they're going to be <laughs> i honestly think the thousand mile variant is honestly the only one where you might get away without dc charging 
because you'd have to drive pretty much all day yeah. to deplete that. And then you wouldn't want a DC charge. That would be too fast, too expensive. You'd want a AC overnight or whatever. Long, long trips I plan on having one of these. We found that's yeah. not that much weight to add the DC fast charging, so. Good, good. It's really just a little extra complexity. Because I know there's been a lot of, pretty much everybody's adopted NACs at mm -hmm. this point. Do you guys get to experiment with that at superchargers nearby? Do you get to toy around with accepting currents or whatever? Yeah, I mean, it's through the Tesla network, so, mm -hmm. you know, it'll be an agreement with them to pay us so they get to uh, uh they get the benefit as well yeah we think the tesla infrastructure is the best infrastructure which is why we had forty-two thousand people including yourself sign a petition to get the oh, yeah. federal government to make that the standard instantly and, and elon <laughs> opened up his heart and his technology <laughs> yeah. to us and now right. we have the nax standard uh, but we think it's cool that all the other um you know ev america and uh, blink and charge point and all those are going next as well so you can absolutely one standard plug for everybody and what we hope is that they kind of unify the standard between everybody so you only have one payment system right so, you know basically through your aptera.us account uh -huh. we'll be able to bill you directly and then we pay blink we pay charge america we pay tesla gotcha um and you just see it you know on your on your aptera.us account would the goal be plug and charge like you just plug it in and it goes or is yeah. that Okay. Yeah. Authentication awesome. and all that. I mean, that's for the birds. Yeah. So if you drive a right. Tesla, you drive up and you go bloop. And yeah, you that's what you're used to. You well, um, with this, it should be less plugging in than any than ever. Yeah. <laughs> Small use case for it because it's going to be driving mostly on sunlight. We kind of want to taunt the other EV owners because we're charging <laughs> five times faster than everybody else. I mean, pull up beside a Rivian truck and you're like, oh, yeah. that's, that's a pretty slow charge, brother. Yeah. Like 20 yeah. miles an hour. Oh, that's, uh, that's too bad. Even with lower <laughs> kilowatts, right? Yeah, Are you still targeting around 50? 50, yeah. Okay. And with that, that's equivalent to four or five times more kilowatts, right? Yeah, you know, the uh, the superchargers are getting good, um, uh -huh. you know, especially around here if you live in a populous area, so you yeah. get up to 200 kilowatts at some fast charging right. Tesla stations. But all the other stations, you know, they're still in the 50 kilowatt, maybe 100 kilowatt range, so. But you, you can know, take we'll, advantage we'll, of those. Stand out. Yeah. Right. That's all great, guys, but we're charging right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's literally plugged into the Wirelessly. Sun. So that's the, that's it. Wireless charging. There's sunlight yeah. producing energy into this vehicle for you right now. You could charge your phone in there and everything so off grid which we've been talking a lot about recently all the, all the grid concerns about electrification and everybody moving by certain standards so i feel like governments both at the state and federal level should be trying to push as hard as can like grid independent or very barely interfering grid electric vehicles like this one are the pi builds able to test supercharging yes cool Cool. That'll be exciting. Uh, one of the cool things about the solar, too, talking about governments and how they relate to us. Uh -huh. I mean, we've been talking to more fleets recently oh, as we yeah. get closer to production. Uh -huh. And the hard thing with fleets is if you have, you know, 100 or 200 vehicles at your fleet location, the utility can't run enough power to charge right. 200 Teslas at one spot. Right. So, you know, Very you expensive. end up having these remote parking lots and then, you know, one fleet owner has like six parking lots around town and mm. that's the only way they can get enough power. With the Aptera, the sun charges it. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's great for kind of, you know, um, getting electric vehicles out there without stressing the grid. All these EV fleet, you know, ado adoptions also come with the EV charging infrastructure hassle and right. expense. Right. So you buy a Tesla, you install a $5,000 charger to charge your Tesla, you know, at whatever commercial fleet place it is. But with this, you know, even if you exceeded the 40 miles a day you'd get from the solar charging, you can still plug it in with a 110 extension cord and get 200 miles overnight. Right. Doesn't have to be some special. So, you know, you can pull a bunch of, you know, 15 amp circuits off of any building. You can yeah. pull 100 circuits usually so it's not this hassle of having to tie to the grid it's the sun's doing all the charging right it's right. clean it's green it's as good as it gets and hopefully you know we'll be building more of these for fleet applications and commercial applications sure. and consumer applications over time there's only one wiper blade yep just like a cyber truck <laughs> yeah that already reduces your uh, cost to maintain too on top of that we get um, a little fortunate that the uh, motorcycle regulations don't make sure that you have passenger visibility oh. so we, we don't have to wipe that side of the screen so you, you know the arc, goes up pretty far. the arc from this is going to be like that gotcha so the driver's going to have great vision but yeah. you know, right in front of the passenger you're not going to have the clear, clearest vision yeah and yeah, other <laughs> automobiles have to wipe that so you end up with two wiper blades because you have to get up there gotcha but for us Man. you know the lightest weight the least complex is the single blade and the Thanks, rain axe and stuff you have now the, the cool thing about the aptera is it's so aerodynamic that the laminar flow carries most of your water away so oh that's you rain axe on your windshield oh, okay you, you know, there is a little bit of an advantage to the shape yeah because it is rounded 
so aerodynamic. Burdened as much with it. Yeah. And is there a little bit of an advantage in terms of like bug splatter in that regard? Yeah, you'll get bug yeah. splatter right Surface. here. That's, That's about it. it. That's it. Every, everything else is a roller coaster ride for the bugs. <laughs> Years ago, when we were testing with the old Aptera, we were uh -huh. in Nevada and there was like, it was like bug heaven. So we yeah. had like the chase car, it was like, you know, a truck. And it was what we pulled the trailer out there with. And the truck is just covered with bugs. <laughs> yeah. And the Aptera, like, had no bug. Like, what the hell? Nice. Keeps Not it easier single, to clean. Not a single windshield bug splatter. Nice. I've never wished I was a billionaire more than right now, so I can get you guys to production. That's you don't have to give us your whole billion, though. No. Only, <laughs> only part of it. You know, if we could just get one billionaire to part with, you know, like a tenth of their... You know, yeah. You know, people can still live on 900 million. Oh, yeah. sounds like a struggle, but <laughs> I bet they could make it work. I have a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Are you going to add handles to get in the car? Like, oh. Yeah, the, the interesting thing that we kind of tell people and most people will get it after some time with a vehicle is to, yeah is to set your butt down butt first and then put your feet in the vehicle so if you try to get into it like an suv or a car you're looking like oh you know how do i how do i get my oh i gotta grab something mm. but it's really you just gotta take your time that's the uptera way you're saying something about the side impact is this what you're talking about yeah this, bi head? this big boxed out section okay. right here is your hip point protection Okay. So there's another box out section in the door and then oh. a cross door beam from that hinge to that hinge. Gotcha. So you've got kind of all this side impact protection, but really most of it's right there. And the cool thing about the Aptera is, you know, usually you'd have, you know, a door that comes straight up. So anything that hits it kind of takes the whole force of it. Mm -hmm. But typically if somebody's going to hit this, they're not going to hit you right in the tangent of the curve. Mm. They're going to hit you lower or higher. So it's going to gl glance off the surface and it's going to move the Aptera before it imparts energy into the Aptera. So you can imagine, right. you know, you never get, you know, a blow directly in here. But if it's a blow like that, it's probably going to lift the Aptera up and skim on the surface down to the bottom, which is Good. great because the, the less energy you impart into the passenger, the safer you are, the less, you know, kind of impact you take. Kind of compensates for a lack of a uh, side airbag, right? Are they just frontal airbags? Yeah, just front airbags uh -huh. here and on the side. But yeah, we tried to really build up the, uh, the side impact protection for just that reason. Do you okay. have a um, wireless uh, phone charger in there? Uh, this one doesn't, but uh, the idea, and Jason can speak to this more, is that the center console is modular. Oh, so we can okay. We place the different elements of the center console. Different cup holder you sizes. Have, you know, storage up here or an inductive charger for your phone. You could have different style cup holders if you want. You could have different style, you know, rear storage. You know, you may be electronic heavy or you may be electronic light or you may like a, you know, a super big cup of coffee in the morning <laughs> or maybe not. Are those modules something you guys will make or just kind of publish the standards so uh, other people make them? Uh, yeah, you know, the, the cool Both. thing about being Both. kind of an open source company, right to repair company is we're yeah. not afraid to share data. We'll share the actual CAD with you. So if you want to make a center console module, Nice. 3D printed and you wrap it in, you know, some kind of vegan leather, or pineapple leather. Yeah, itself, yeah. And you just make an accessory for Aptera. Yeah, we hope that we can, you know, let the aftermarket be a force multiplier for us. It's a great idea. You know, a lot of people jumped on the line with Tesla, you know, early on. And mm -hmm. a lot of my early Tesla accessories were from third parties that sure. just saw a market and made it happen. Yeah, yeah. Good call. Okay, are we ready to go inside? Okay, so the assembly line goes basically in a U or an L uh -huh. from, from where uh, one of the alphas are back here uh -huh. over to that corner. Wow. And then as we walk in, uh -huh. you'll see a green line in the middle here, and the green line is where we build our battery. Our